thank you for your goodness, Lord, to us, oh God. So undeserved, but God, your grace, your mercy.
you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. For your mercy. Come on, somebody worship him a minute. Lord, I'm looking forward to that city, God. Thank you, Jesus. Someday, Lord. will be over. All the pain, all the heart, all the hurt. No more tears. I get to see Jesus. Anybody excited about the day the trumpet's going to sound and call us all to be home? Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Shake two or three hands around you and tell them it's good to see you in church on a Sunday morning. church on a Sunday morning. I know we have uh, students in college and career that are uh, in Chattanooga right now. They're in church as uh, I think as we speak they may be in church right now and uh, had great services last night and 
Uh, excited for our students in college and career to go get pumped up and fired up. There's a void right here. And uh, it almost seemed like some adults were nervous whether they should get out and worship or not because uh, we didn't have our leaders here, I guess. I don't know. I have to tell them how valuable they are to us. Um, and so we're thankful for uh, what they're doing. Back in the back, they're having power hour in the back in the room full of kids back there in children's church. And so uh, just all kinds of stuff happen. And we're excited to be in the kingdom of God and be part of this wonderful kingdom. Got sickness going around, this nonsense, and so we just need to pray that off of uh, everybody that's connected with us and our community and uh, county, that everybody's getting so sick, we got to shut school down, and so we just need to pray that junk out of here and uh, just, just say we don't have it here, go someplace else, go over to L.A. or <laughs> New Orleans, or I probably shouldn't say that. We don't want it to go anywhere. We just want it to get out. That's just where we want it to go. In Jesus' name. I want us to pray before we get started here today. And uh, uh, the subject that I'm going to deal with today is something that uh, all of us are guilty at one point or another. And uh, so I want us to pray because I, I have I've put a lot of time and energy into these lessons. I hope you're getting something out of them. Um, if you haven't been to all of them, go back. I'll mention that and watch them. Uh, I'm trying to condense about probably something that should be seven or eight weeks. I'm trying to get into about four. Um, but I'm trying to hit some highlights of some things. And um, this subject this morning that I'm going to deal with, I'm going to deal with defeating the spirit of mammon. And uh, <clears throat> most of you will immediately think and, and go straight to the fact that mammon just means money. And uh, that's so far from the truth that it's not just money that it's talking about and so i want to give you some stuff here today but here's what i need you to pray god help our pastor we're going to be like in some other religions you're going to just repeat after me these words <clears throat> what i want you to do is i want you to pray for me today and uh, i i prayed this week and on several occasions i said god i need you to help me uh as I bring this across, because it's vitally important to our walk with God and to understanding this whole principle of the blessed life. But at the same time, and I covered this last week, uh, at the same time, if we're not careful, we'll carry some feelings on our sleeve and get offended by some stuff. And uh, I, I can't have you get offended at the Word of God. So um, I'm just going to give it to you as the Word is there. And uh, we're going to apply these things to our lives and Brother Tim Reynolds says it all the time, if you got offended, go read a bait of Satan. So, and understand that we all need to grow, and, and I, I, I have been guilty of this as, as much as anybody else in the room, and so this is something that's going to better all of us, and uh, we want God just to touch. And so I want you to pray for me to deliver this word uh, the way that God wants it done, and then at the same time pray for you that God will open up my ears and my heart, let me receive this, God let me put everything aside, there's no... Uh, he's not preaching just to me here today. He's preaching to all of us. He's preaching to the pulpit. He's preaching to everybody today. And so uh, just, just keep that in mind, okay? Because here's what the devil will do to you. This happens in regular church services, not just when we're dealing with the blessed life. The devil gets on your shoulder and says, well, that preacher's talking to you today. He must know something. <laughs> well, God does. I may not, but God does. And uh, you know what's amazing is he knows what we need to hear. And so let's just receive it. When that happens and the devil jumps on your shoulder, say, man, I'm glad he's preaching to me because I need this. And God obviously understands I need it, so I want more of it. So let's pray. Let's ask God to touch us here today. Lord, we love you this morning. God, I thank you, Lord, for your presence. God, I thank you for your anointing, God, that we feel in this house today. God, as we have already sang, Lord, about the wonderful place called heaven God, each and every one of us desire to be there one day. And God, whatever you need to change in me, and God, whatever you need to do different in me, God, that I might be there one day. God, I pray, Lord, that you will shape me, God, form me, mold me into what you would have me to be. God, touch me today. God, touch my mind. God, touch my lips, Lord, to deliver your anointed word. God, I pray, Lord, that you touch the heart, God, of each and every one of us here today. God, touch our ears, Lord, to hear it, God, and to respond to it. God, let it take root deep on the inside of us. And God, we're going to give you all of the glory. We're going to give you all of the honor and the praise for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, 
And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Uh, I'm going to give a little opening here, but if you want to turn to your uh, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. We're going to uh, read a few verses from there this morning, but we're going to continue our, our third week of this series discussing the, uh, the blessed life. It, it's, it's a series really based off of a book uh, by Robert Morris by the same title. I strongly encourage you to get the book and read it. Uh, it, it goes into a lot of detail, some tremendous information uh, on this subject. It's a great resource, but as I mentioned last week, uh, I've, I've studied as well as uh, firsthand experienced this subject for 20 plus years of ministry. And uh, I, I know that if these biblical principles are put into place, you will be able to live a blessed life. Not just uh, a blessed wallet that are so many people are looking for, but truly a blessed life. And so I hope you understand this morning that uh, the return on investment, if you, if you do anything as far as finances are concerned, you'll hear them make that a statement, a return on investment. Uh, I hope you understand that the return on investment to the kingdom of God does not come just in a monetary form. It doesn't come just in the form of money. There are so many blessings that God showers down on you and I that you could never put a monetary value on. Tell me how you can value praying and God healing and touching your body. What value can you put on that? What value can you put on your family living for God? What value can you put on your children living for God? There is no value in that. And so I hope that you understand uh, that a return on investment to the kingdom of God doesn't just come back in the form of money. It does many times, but it doesn't come back in that form of just money. And so that is why we are seeking to live uh, a blessed life and not just to have our money increased. And so in the last two weeks, Uh, I have covered a tremendous amount of ground, and I hope that you're grasping uh, the principles. I encourage you to study the subject for yourself, look deeper into each one of these principles that we have covered. Uh, But again, as I said, this is a series that probably really could take seven to eight weeks to really cover in depth, but due to obviously time constraints and calendars and scheduling and all those things, I'm trying to make sure that you get the concepts uh, in in order uh, uh, for your home and for your family and for your life to be blessed. And uh, the, the book is a, is a great book to read. It's a good cross-reference with Scripture. Uh, of course, that's where you need to study all the time is Scripture because God has a lot to say uh, about money and how we handle it. And uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of principles that are in there. But the first week, uh, we felt and, and dealt with the heart. It's a foundational part. Our heart has to be right. If our heart is not right, um, we can't ever get the rest of it right. And so our heart is a foundational part, has to be right. You know, anytime somebody would argue with me whether they should or, or shouldn't have to tithe, anytime there's an argument that comes up, I always immediately understand there's a heart condition at play. Anytime somebody would argue it, it has to be a heart condition because why would you not want to bring back to God what belongs to him after everything that he's done for you? Why would that even be an argument? And so there has to be a heart condition. There's a a heart condition at play. And so uh, we covered the fact that it's not a give and get heart. We're not looking uh, for trying to get something in return, but he's looking for a get and then give and actually the reverse of that. And so uh, the reflection principle we talked about, you put in, uh, you get out what you put in. If I'm, if I'm serving God with an open hand, uh, God's able to take things out of it, but at the same time, God's able to put stuff back into it. And so we covered uh, all of those things. But then Last week, we covered the subject of tithing, and uh, first week, we dealt and didn't even talk about money. We dealt with everything else but money, and then last week, we talked about tithing, and we talked about the test of first fruits, and uh, we, we showed that it's a test. We show that uh, tithing was a test and is a test. It's a test every week. Every week, you get your paycheck. Every two weeks, every month, whatever it is, uh, you take a test every time you get paid. Every time you get an increase, you take a test. And so we showed that tithing is a test. We showed that it's biblical, uh, faced all the arguments as to why uh, we shouldn't have to. And so we understand that it's biblical. We understand that it's a blessing. Uh, we understand that it is the first of our first fruits. How many remember the 10 $1 bills I laid out here? I try to use some illustrations so you don't forget some things. But I laid out 10 $1 bills. And uh, the tithe on that is how much? $1, okay? 
And so if the tithe on that is $1, if I give this dollar to the mortgage, I give this dollar to the electric, I give this dollar to the gas, I give this one to everybody else, and I get done, and I still have that $1, I still have my tithe, right? No, because he said it's the first of the first fruits. That's what God said. And so the first thing I give is the tithe. Now, you can give it, but it's not tithe. It's an offering. Okay? Everybody with me? And so we covered that last week. It's not, uh, if it's not first, then it's not tithe. It's offering, but it can't be tithe because he said it has to be the first of the first fruits. We went through that. The Lord made it very clear in the Old Testament as well in the New Testament that tithing belongs to him. It's his. We covered that several scriptures. It's his. It belongs to him. He said the tithing is mine. And we are not, uh, we are not to give tithe. We are to bring tithe because we can't give what doesn't belong to us it belongs to him anyway we're just bringing back the portion that he's requested remember i put the three guys up here and gave them money every month and they were supposed to give so much to my wife remember how that and jesus went away and and he's gone for a period of time but he said take care of my bride and the bride is what it's the church and so uh he said those things belong to him bring it to his house and if we if we don't then he simply considered it stealing and our money will be cursed there's only two ways to handle tithing you either bring it or you steal it that's the only two things you can do with it he said if you don't bring it then you've stolen it from me and so it will be cursed and since he is a god that does not change we covered that pretty much in depth last week that he is a god that is does not change i am god and i change not Uh, then we can safely say that the same principles still apply even to us today. If we want the curse removed from our money, then we must redeem it by bringing the tithe to his house, and then he will bless and multiply the remaining 90%. I'm going to cover more of that next week, and I'm going to give some testimonies of individuals who have experienced how this works. Uh, As a matter of fact, I mentioned to our Sunday school teachers who are involved in children's church today, uh, and I'm saying the same thing to you. Uh, I know there's many of you that have testimonies uh, because you've told me about them, but I'm asking that if you want me to uh, use them, I'm not going to say anybody's names, but I want you to send those to me. Don't come to me after church and tell it to me, text it to me, otherwise I won't remember. I was in Sunday school in the meeting and said the same thing, and one of them went, well, listen, you need to, I said, don't tell me now, because I won't remember it when it comes to it. Send it to me. But I want to see that those testimonies relate to what we've been teaching in this series. I'd love uh, to share those highlights of those testimonies this next week coming up. And, and, and how many of you have, have experienced some of what I'm talking about, how God does this, just across the room? You've experienced it, okay? So I want to share some of that with you next week. And so that's what brings us to this point. And this week I'm going to deal with this part of the subject again that uh, every one of us in this room have been guilty of at one point or another. The word mammon, the word mammon, Uh, is only mentioned four times in Scripture, and every one of those times it's done by Jesus. Uh, In Matthew 6, where the uh, uh, is a a parallel Scripture of what we're fixing to read uh, here in Luke, but three times it's found in the book of Luke, and then the other time it's found in that parallel Scripture in Matthew, telling the same story again being told uh, by Jesus. And so I want to go through that. But in these short verses, there is a very strong statement made about serving mammon. Okay? The Bible makes a very strong statement about serving mammon. I'm going to try to slow down and, and teach a little bit more today than I am preaching, so uh, just bear with me here today. But I, I want to deal with this very powerful principle, and that is defeating the spirit of mammon. Because it's very plain in Scripture, and we're going to read here in just a moment in Luke 16. It's very, very plain in Scripture that there is a contrast going on between God and mammon. And so it's important that we understand what that is right it's almost like without holiness no man can see god that makes holiness very very important it's the same thing here this morning luke chapter 16 uh let me start at verse number nine it says and i say to you jesus speaking here make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon there's the first time we see it that when you fail they may receive you into an everlasting home verse 10 says he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much and he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much therefore if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon there's the second time who will commit to your trust the true riches 
And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? <clears throat> and then the famous verse, verse 13, says, No servant can serve two masters, for he either will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Third time it shows up, he says, you cannot. Everybody say cannot. He didn't say it'd be difficult. He didn't say it'd be a challenge. He said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Cannot serve God and mammon. So if that's the case, that I have to choose, then I need to make sure I understand what they are. Now, I think we all understand who God is, right? So I need to get an understanding of what mammon is. And so the first question uh, that we have to ask is to properly understand what is mammon? What is that word? What does that mean? And so uh, I found this article that gives a little background on the meaning of the word mammon. It says that originally the word mammon came from the ancient, uh, ancient Chaldeans, or you remember the Ur of the Chaldees, uh, where Abraham came from. And it actually has its roots in the word confidence. That's very interesting. It has its roots in the word confidence. Originally, uh, uh, at its most basic level, the word meant riches or wealth, but it implies this personified wealth gained uh, by greed. It often uh, took on a deity or a God nature, okay? And so watch how this, how this just grows. During the New Testament times, the word mammon continued to have this personified understanding of worldly and material wealth with a focus on the evil influence that money can have. In the Middle Ages, mammon gained a full-on demon status in the Middle Ages. Many local bishops and uh, feudal lords benefited from the fear and the trembling that peasants felt about gaining worldly wealth. And, and, and it's not even been that long ago when I remember men telling us that if you had money, you were going to hell. Because worldly wealth is just going to go to hell you can't serve mammon you can't serve money well i need to make sure i got an understanding of what that means because that isn't what god meant didn't mean that if you got money you're going to hell oh yeah but a rich man can't even make it through the eye a camel's got a better chance of going through the eye that's not what he means and so we got to make sure that we understand we can't use those things uh to, to false represent the word of god and so uh after this the enlightenment time if you will mammon was still a concern it was shown in paintings with people uh, at his feet receiving from him. I found some paintings, uh, pictures online that have been done. But in the 1800s, uh, Francis Colin D. Uh, Plancy's uh, depiction of all of the demons that would afflict the world, and one of those demons included the demon Mammon. And in his depiction, he actually had him looking a little wimpy, which the devil is wimpy, so I guess that's not a bad thing. But if you think... Uh, that, that mammon is now only mentioned in church theology discussions. That's not a word that we use. That's a theology discussion. Uh, that's not something that we even talk about anymore. Uh, I need you to understand the exact opposite of that is true. Mammon is very, very much alive. As a matter of fact, I know this probably dates a little bit, but it's still kind of active. Uh, uh, in the game Dungeons and Dragons game, anybody ever remember hearing that? The Dungeons and Dragons game that our children were playing. Mammon has become the arch devil, and the rules he rules over the nine layers of hell in this kids' game, Dungeons and Dragons. In keeping with the traditional use of the name in literature, he is portrayed as a personification of greed and lust. He also has a well-earned reputation or deceit or deception or fraud or trickery. He's not nearly the wimpy looking one that Duplancy uh, made him sound like. In the world today, he is still very, very active. Mammon is so often referred to uh, many times. He's, he's referred to simply as money. Uh, mammon is just money. And so you can't serve God and serve money. And so therefore you can't have money and serve God. So the only people that can serve God are the poor folks. Let me, let me go a little bit deeper than that. The word mammon is an Aramaic word that is translated riches. It comes from uh, the Syrian god of riches that they called mammon. 
Uh, God was speaking of something that these people were very familiar with, and they understood when he mentioned you can't serve God and serve mammon. They understood it. The god mammon came from Babylon, and Babylon came from the Tower of Babel. Babel means confusion. The word Babel means confusion. That's why when you say somebody that's just talking, you don't understand what they're saying, you say that they are what? They're babbling. Okay, so it comes from, Babylon comes from the Tower of Babel. Babel means uh, confusion, and that second part, on, means sown or planted. So Babylon means sown in confusion. Okay, now this is where this God mammon's coming from. The people who were building the Tower of Babel had a system in place that they did not believe they needed God, that they could get to heaven on their own. They could do so by their own power, by their own knowledge, by their own authority. They could build high enough to reach heaven and could do so without the Lord's help. That was the Tower of Babel. That was these people that this this is rooted from, this has come from. And so the spirit of mammon is one that says, I don't need God. I have riches and I have money, so therefore I don't need God. It is a spirit that contrasts itself with the spirit of God. It is an arrogant, prideful spirit that tries to replace God. Okay? Everybody with me? Whole lot more than just money. Mammon is something when God said, you, Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. It lets you know that the spirit of mammon is obviously looking for servants. You can't serve God and serve mammon. So the spirit of mammon is looking for servants. Mammon wants to rule in your life. Mammon wants you to look to it instead of looking to God. Many of us grew up looking to mammon and we didn't even realize that we were doing so. Jesus said you can't serve both. You'll be loyal to one or you'll dis- and you'll despise the other. The prosperity doctrine that I mentioned a little bit of last week, the prosperity doctrine was give and you'll get. If you'll give, then God's going to bless you with Mercedes and Rolexes and big houses and boats and all this kind of stuff. If you'll give, then you're going to get. And as I stated in the very first lesson, that teaching is actually something that works selfishness and greed back into your life and not out of your life. Because now the only reason I'm doing it is that I get something in return. It works selfishness and greed back in my life. It is a mammon message. People become loyal to mammon or money. And when something breaks or comes apart in their lives financially, they then despise God. Watch me. They, they get loyal to mammon. And when something breaks or falls apart financially in their life, they despise God. They get mad at God because they're loyal to mammon if you're loyal to mammon you will despise god please hear me mammon wants to take god's place if you don't believe me watch this mammon promises us everything that only god can give us it promises identity it promises security it promises significance it promises peace and happiness mammon promises all of these things but only god can give happiness and peace and significance and security only god can give those things but mammon promises it here's what you need to understand mammon can never deliver on its promise but mammon wants to rule you cannot serve god and mammon let me take it to another level Think about this for a minute. Mammon is really the spirit of the Antichrist. Think about it. I'll prove it to you. There's a scripture that we all know, and I don't know that we've ever put it together this way, but the spirit of the Antichrist does not rule through the threat of nuclear war. When you go back and do your study on the Antichrist, it doesn't rule through the threat of nuclear war. The spirit of the Antichrist rules through the threat of of not being able to buy and sell. That's the threat of the spirit of the Antichrist, is to not be able to buy and sell. That's mammon. If you don't bow, if you don't take the mark of the beast, then you won't be able to provide for your family. That's the spirit of mammon. Trust mammon and not God. 
Trust in your money and not in God. See? You're going to be a servant to one or a servant to the other, but you cannot serve both. It's a contrast. Mammon will say this. You ready? If you had more money, people would listen to you. That's significance. If you had the right car or the right house or the right clothes, then you would be happier. If you had more money, watch, your marriage would be better. That's security, right? Here's the big one. If you had more money, watch, you could help more people. The peace. I, I can help more people. If I only had more money, then I could, I could help more people. Please understand something, and I, I'm saying this as clear as I possibly can. Money does not help people. God helps people. I don't care how much money you got to give. Money don't help people. God helps people. All of us have been influenced by the spirit of mammon at some point uh, in our lives. We have all made statements. You ready? Here we go. This is where I get close to where we live. We've all been here. We make statements like this. I either need God to come through or I need somebody to give me some money. I either need God to come through. I'm going to come down and pray. And God, if you don't come through, I need somebody to give me some money. The result is that if someone gives me money, then I can say, I'm okay, God. I don't need you to solve my problem. It's already been solved because I got some money. Oh, it's quiet in here. That's mammon. That's what mammon is. It's a spirit that looks for servants to draw them from God, draw them from their dependence on God. It's a spirit that tries to influence us from God. Because you cannot serve God and mammon. You love one and you despise the other. Look at this. Let me pull a couple of points from this article that I found on this subject of mammon. It says mammon, again, is the personification of money worship and greedy pursuit. Money is simply a commodity of trade. But when it becomes an idol that is worshipped and coveted and pursued with lust and desire, then it becomes mammon and dangerous to anyone who possesses it. For centuries, the church knew what to do with money. Our ancestors could squeeze a dollar until it hollered and still have something left over to give to somebody else. True? And then we began to subscribe to this American dream. The house with the white picket fence and the two and a half kids and the Chevy in the driveway and all of the things that we had as this persona of the American dream. And we, we didn't sway from the word of God per se, but we began to find comfort in seeking scriptures to justify our pursuit of material wealth. And we generally study those scriptures out of context. Thus, we invited the spirit of mammon into the church again there is nothing wrong with money please hear me don't walk out of here saying pastor says there's problems with money nothing wrong with money there is nothing wrong with material possessions you can have all the stuff you want to have there's nothing wrong with that the problem is that we focus so much on stuff that we take our eyes off of him and his kingdom and then the spirit of mammon begins to have an influence over our lives and it does so even in our worship. Here, let me help you. We praise God like we're losing our minds after we get a raise. But we moan and roll around on the altar when we're not approved for a car loan. Spirit of mammon gets a hold of us, and we even begin to worship differently. Oh, I worship when that raise came in and that, that bonus came in. Boy, I, woo, I'm running the aisles. I'm excited. But I got turned down for something I wanted, and now all of a sudden I'm upset about it. And just zapped your worship. Have you ever thought that maybe you got turned down because God didn't want you to have it? 
Instead of just, let me just stay here for a second. Instead of me getting all upset over the fact I didn't get something, maybe it gives me an opportunity to go back and look at my budget and go, you know what, God, thank you for stopping me from making a huge mistake that would have cost me and I couldn't have given to your kingdom and I couldn't have done the things that I should do because of the decision I was made. Thank you, God. Instead of just worshiping when we get the extra. Hmm. We go and lay hands on a house because some man of God on TV told us we ought to. That's my house, God. You're going to give me that house. You're going to give me that house. But then we question God when we discover, what? My credit score is only in 500? (laughs) Why? Why would you do that, God? (laughs) The spirit of mammon fools you into thinking Watch, that you'll walk with the same anointing as your spiritual father if you just sow into his life. Of course, you want the Bentley and you want the large house and you want all of the stuff, so you believe the lie. When in fact, all you're doing is, is furnishing this, uh, his affluent lifestyle that the spirit of mammon wants you to follow. The spirit of mammon would be rendered null and void. Watch, if we didn't feed it with our wanton greed. If we were passionate about the things of God versus the stuff of the world, then that foul spirit would die for hunger. Listen, I like nice things, just like everybody else does. I like nice things. I don't, however, allow my desire for nice things to skew my vision or my focus on advancing the kingdom of God. There's a difference, there's a battle, there's a contrast. Between God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. Everybody with me so far? This is a whole lot deeper issue than just money. So the, that's the first question. What is mammon? I hope I've helped you answer that. So, so if, if I understand that mammon is a spirit, there's a deity, there's a godhood, if you will, a, a demon attached to this, this spirit of mammon. If, if, if you understand that, that it's more than just money, then my next question probably would have to be, then is money evil? Is money evil? What was Jesus referring to when he said unrighteous mammon was uh, uh, in the scripture that we began to read? What, what was he referring to when he said unrighteous mammon? Please understand, mammon is a spirit. If mammon is not a spirit, then why does it speak to all of us? Oh, it, it doesn't speak to me. Mammon don't speak to me, really? The next time we go to take up an offering... We go to take up a special offering. We have a a missionary here or we have a a special need maybe that's just something that we we need to take up an offering for. And we we got to take up this special offering. And I I present this offering to you. And guess what happens? Mammon starts talking. Well, you can't afford to give in that offering. If you give in that offering, you're not going to have enough money for groceries. Hmm. Mammon will speak to us because the moment we take up an offering we all start hearing voices <laughs> that's all right i figured it'd be about this loud in here here's what you have to understand mammon is a spirit that rests on money all money has a spirit on it all money It either has the spirit of God on it or it has the spirit of mammon on it. You ready? Let me get where we live. All the money in your bank account right now. Right now. Some of you are going, there ain't much money in my bank account right now. (laughs) All the money in your bank account right now. The money in your wallet, in your purse right now. All of the money you have right now either has the spirit of God on it or it has the spirit of mammon on it because it has a spirit on it. The way you get God's spirit on it is you bring, everybody say bring, you bring the first 10% to the house of God. He redeems the rest of it and, and takes it out from underneath the spirit of mammon. Let me ask you this question. Why would you want the spirit of mammon on your money? Why would you even want it on your money? It's going to have one or the other. 
And the only way you get it out from underneath the spirit of mammon is it has to be redeemed. I covered that last week. Go back and watch last week's lesson. Here's what you have to understand. Please listen to me. Money is not evil. Oh, yes, it is. No, it's not. Money is neutral. Money is not evil. It's neutral. You can do good with money or you can do bad with money. Money is not evil. It's just neutral. You can do good with it. You can do bad with it. People that don't know scripture say, well, I know what the Bible says. The Bible says that money is the root of all evil. (laughs) Go back and read your Bible. I mean, that's what the preacher told me. (laughs) Find a new preacher. (laughs) Because here's what it says. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. For which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money's not evil. Money's neutral. Loving and serving mammon is the root of all evil. So let's look at this verse that he said, 16 and verse 9 of Luke. He said, and again, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into the everlasting home. Now, if we're not careful, we'll misinterpret this scripture. If we don't understand that unrighteous mammon is a spirit or a God of greed and not just money, we'll miss what this verse is really saying to us. You could believe it, and and, and you could believe that it's saying, make friends with money, or... Do good things for people, and then when you need help, they're going to do good things for you. Okay? Everybody see that? You could misinterpret it that way. That's not what it's saying at all. What's being spoken here by Jesus, let me show you based on, based on things that we've already covered over the last two weeks. If you take this unrighteous mammon and you redeem it by bringing the first 10% to God and use this money that Satan would use for evil, you can use it to build the kingdom of God and people will find salvation because, and become your friends in the kingdom or your brothers and sisters in the Christ. And then when you fail, which that word literally means when you die, when you fail, these people will welcome you into your eternal home. Watch, there will be people in heaven because you gave to the kingdom of God. There will be people in heaven because you gave to missions, people that you may have never met, but they will welcome you to your eternal home, thanking you for what you did because you sent to a missionary who then told them about the gospel, who then they found salvation, and now they're in heaven because of what you have done, and they're your friends, your brothers and sisters in Christ, and they are welcoming you to your new home. God is the only one who can take unrighteous mammon and turn it into true riches, and true riches are souls. It's not stuff, it's not possessions, it's souls. Let me prove it to you. The people beside you right now, look at somebody next to you. The people beside you, the ones you come in contact with at work or at school, the, in the stores or in your family, are the only things that will last for eternity. Their soul will last for eternity, that will last forever. That is true riches. And God can take unrighteous mammon and turn it into souls that will be saved for eternity. So money is not evil. It just needs to be used for the right purpose. There was a song, and I'm not there going to sing it, I'll just give you the words, but Ray Boltz had a way of telling stories with songs. And and we've played this song on, on videos, and every time they have a mission service, they'll play it. But the song says, Thank you for giving to the Lord. Because I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm so glad that you gave. He talks about a man stood before you and said, Remember the time that a missionary came to your church and his pictures made you cry. You didn't have much money, but you gave it anyway. And Jesus took the gift you gave, and that's why I'm here today. This is on this stroll that he's taken through heaven. And he says, one by one they came as far as the eye could see. Each life somehow touched by your generosity. 
I'm going to talk about that next week. Little things that you had done, sacrifices that you had made, unnoticed on earth, but in heaven, they're now proclaimed. And now up in heaven, I know that you're not supposed to cry, but I'm almost sure there were tears in your eyes as Jesus took your hand and you stood before the Lord and he said, my child, look around you. Great is your reward. It's an investment in the souls. Money is not evil. Money is neutral. It's what we do with money that makes the difference. And so then the last question should be this. Then what should I do with money? What should I do with my money? Well, the easy answer is to be a good steward with what you have. That's the easy answer. Be a good steward. Some people would say, well, and not here, of course, but in in other places, people have made statements like, I don't have enough of this unrighteous mammon to really even be concerned with this principle that you're trying to teach. I don't have enough of it, so it really don't matter. I don't, I don't even need to listen to this part. Some of you zoned me out just a little while ago. I, I don't need to listen to this because I don't have enough of this anyway to even worry about it. If I had more, then I'd be useful. So this, this isn't really something that helps me. This, this would be more useful if I had more money. If I had more of this unrighteous mammon you're talking about, then, then, then I, I, would be, I would be better attuned to listen to what you're saying and these principles would really help me. But I, I'm just telling you it doesn't help me because I don't have enough of it. So let me just say this in all the love that I possibly can. If this is your mindset, that I don't have enough to be concerned with what Jesus taught on this subject, then please hear me as lovingly as I can be. You will never have any more. Watch Luke 16 and verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Watch me. If you have a little and you don't tithe, you're never going to tithe when you have much. Let that settle for just a second. Because if you're not going to tithe on the little bit you have, I promise you ain't going to tithe on the lot you have. If he's unjust in the least, he'll be unjust in the much. See, we all start off with a little and God sees if he can trust us. And when he sees that he can trust us, then he gives us some more and then he gives us some more and then he gives us some more until we reach the level that we can be a blessing to our family and a blessing to others, whatever that amount may be. You, you, you will not be faithful in a little. You're not going to be faithful in much. That's the word of God speaking. That's not me. That's the word of God. Look at it in the New Living Translation, 16 and verse 10. It says, if you are faithful in little things... You'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with the greater responsibilities. If you won't tithe on $10, you ain't going to tithe on $100. But if I had more money, that's what I do. That's not the point. The point's not the amount. The point is the principle. Somebody clap your hands for just a moment. Make sure we're okay. Luke chapter 16, verse number 12. We're going through these verses we read earlier. It says, And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Now, there's different applications you can make, but is it possible that an application of this verse would be this, that if we have not been faithful in what belongs to God, who's going to give you more? If you haven't been faithful in what belongs to another man, who's going to give you more? If we've not been faithful... And what belongs to God, then how can we expect God to give us more? If we're not faithful in bringing God the tithe, how can we expect him to give us more? Remember, tithing is a what? It's a test. Tithing is a test. It's important for us to understand that God is testing us with the tithe. Now, look at verse number 11, same chapter. Therefore... If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? Again, 
True riches is not money. It's the souls that are being won through our giving. Here's a great statement that Robert Morris made in his book. He made this statement. He said, heaven is being populated and hell is being plundered by our giving. Let that sink in for a second. Heaven is being populated, souls, and hell is being plundered, being saved from hell. And it's happening because of our giving. This is why it's so important that I get the concept of giving. When I bring the tithe to the storehouse and God redeems that other 90% and blesses it and I give in my offerings, he turns that in uh, giving into souls. Lives are truly changed through my faithfulness to the kingdom of God and his financial plan beginning with my own life. My own life has changed. I'm going to talk to you about it next week, but there's, there's three different levels of giving. There's three different levels of, of stewardship, if you will, or giving, if you will. The first one is tithing, where we bring to God what belongs to him. The second one is offerings. And then the third one is extravagant giving. Okay? Most Christians, I gave you the percentages last week, never make it to the first level. But here's the good thing. Once you make it to the first level, the next two levels are a piece of cake. Because God starts supplying the whole open hand. When you give to God, God gives back. You begin to get sensitive and start giving to people and start handing things. God has spoken to me at times and spoken to Sister C at times and said, you need to give so-and-so this much money or you need to do this or you need to do that. And God just begins to bless and then turn around and returns it right back. One of the reasons that I cover budgeting and our premarital counseling and the reason I cover it so heavily is because I believe if you can start off with this stewardship thing right, a lot of other things just come together in the order that God intended them to. And so any of you who have been through any of my premarital counseling, the number one item on the budget list is what? Tithing. Number one item on the budget list is tithing. Why is that the case? The reason that is, is because there's nothing else in the budget works if the money we're working with is cursed. Nothing else works. Listen, I don't know about you, but if there is a man, watch, who wants to marry my daughter, I only got one, and she's precious to me. And if there's a man that wants to marry my daughter, I'm going to make for certain he understands tithing. I'll probably call up his pastor and want to see his tithing records. Why would I do that? I don't want my daughter marrying a thief. Because if he's not going to be honest with God, he's not going to be honest with my daughter. Let me take it a step further. The reason, parents that I put your children through this premarital counseling stuff is because I want to make sure I don't want your daughter marrying a thief either. And so I put the principles in place because I don't want to... I've got two sons. I'm teaching my sons this same principle because I don't want them to be thieves. And I don't want them leading their home down a path that is cursed. Are you following me at all here today? I don't want them going down a path that is cursed. I don't want them leading their family. They're the man of their household. Don't you dare be a thief. Don't you dare steal from God because you're cursing your family. And my grandchildren in the very distant future will be cursed as well. Don't put that mentality on the heritage that is to follow after me. I'm going to make sure that I take care of God's money so God will take care of my family. I don't know if you see how important this is. When people, listen, hang on. When people come to me for financial help, the first question I have is, are you tithing properly? Because I don't care how good you are with numbers. You can't fix something that's cursed. Can't fix it. I don't care. You can't fix it if it's cursed. But I don't have enough to tithe. I can't afford to tithe. 
I would hope after what I have just briefly showed you over the last few weeks that you would understand you can't afford not to tithe. Need I remind you of a scripture we covered last week in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12? It says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithe and in offerings. And then it says, verse number 9, very plainly, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Only two ways to handle tithing. You either steal it, or you bring it. That's all there is to it. He said that you bring, uh, that you've robbed me, even the whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me, test me. I told you last week it's a test. Test me now in this, it says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out such blessing that you'll not have room enough to contain it or receive it. How many of you want blessings that are overflowing that you can't contain? This is how it happens. I don't know why other churches don't preach about this stuff. I've had people that have come to me and said, I never heard about this. I was never preached this. I don't understand it because they're hurting you. He says this, watch, verse 11. This is why I'm telling you it's important. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground nor the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says who? The Lord of hosts, the one who doesn't change and all nations will call you blessed for you will be delightful a delightful land says the lord of hosts is anybody with me right now okay i i I need you to i need you to listen to me because i'm fixing to get into an area that i hope you can see my heart in this i hope that you can see what i'm trying to do here and i'm trying to help you does everybody understand i'm trying to help Anybody see what I've covered so far? That if we're not doing this, we're following after a spirit of mammon and you've got to defeat the spirit of mammon in your life. I'm, I'm going to say something that I hope, I hope you see my heart in it. But in many, many years of being in ministry, 20 plus years, it is so rare for me to find someone that needs financial help who has been properly tithing. I got 20 plus years of it. I'm telling you, it's, it's happened, but it's very, very rare that somebody comes needing financial help who's been properly tithing. Now, I say that from firsthand knowledge, and I also have the scripture to back me up because verses 10 and 11, 12 that we've read already make it very, very clear that if I will trust God, he will always see to it that I am taken care of. I, I, want, you to, I want you to help me here today. I, I wish I could get some of you to help me just as a, as a mode of testimony. I don't say anything, but I wish I could get some of you to stand in this room as a statement of truth and what I am saying, that when you are faithful to God and you properly tithe, that God always sees to it that you're taken care of. If that is you and that has happened, I just want you to stand. You can stand as a testimony that God has always come through. Just look around the room. God has always come through when I have done what he's asked me to do properly. God never has failed me. Clap your hands to the Lord. He's never failed me. You can be seated. I don't want you to think I'm just making this stuff up. The reason I cover this principle with every person that we help, and if you need help with something, I'm telling you, Brother brother Robinson's available. I'm available. We'll sit down with you. We'll help you with this stuff, get you to the point where you're stewarding better so that you can do more for the kingdom. I don't have a problem with that, but I want you to understand something. The reason I cover this principle with everyone that we help is because I don't want to then be enabling a cursed situation. Does that make sense? If I don't teach you the principle, then I am enabling a cursed situation. Let let me ask you this question. Is there any one of you in here that would go out to the streets and find a drug addict that's asking you for money and give them more money to buy drugs with? Any of you do that? Or there's an alcoholic on the street that comes to you wanting money and you know good and well, they know they're fixing to go buy more alcohol with it. Is there any of you going to give them money? No, right? That seems pretty simple. 
It's the same principle if I give money to people who don't understand the reason their money's cursed. It's the same principle. I'm enabling them to continue in a curse. You with me? If I just give money to help someone and I don't teach them the principles of tithing, I'm enabling them to continue to be a follower of mammon. Because they put their trust in what? In mammon, in money, not in God. Okay, I'm getting close to wrapping this up. Follow with me. The spirit of mammon will continue to be on them and it will only be a matter of time before they're back again making the same statement. I either need God to bless me or I need somebody to give me some money. We've got to be very careful just handing money to people without teaching them a principle. You know what that's called? We, that, that's just taking them fishing. I didn't teach them how to fish. Remember the old saying? I can take them fishing and feed them for a day. I can teach them how to fish and feed them for life. It's the same principle when it comes to the money. I can give them some money, but I didn't do anything. I didn't fix the curse. I got to teach them the principle so that they better understand it. You cannot rob God and expect to be blessed. It's serving mammon. Jesus said, you will serve one and despise the other. I don't know about you, but I want to despise the spirit of mammon and serve God. If I do, if I do, I will live a blessed life and not just have a blessed wallet. But that's a byproduct of a blessed life. So let me do this in closing. Why? Why would God bless you when you're not a good steward of what he's already given you? Let me share that parallel scripture with you in Matthew in closing today. Matthew 6, verses 19. I'm going to read through this uh, rather quickly, but 19 through verse 34. You can go back and look at it later, but it says, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven or on earth where moth and rust doth uh, destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in to steal. For where your treasure is, Told you the first week, God don't want your money. He wants your heart. He's not concerned about you. He's not broke. He paves his streets with gold. He's not broke. He don't want your money. He wants your heart. The lamp of the body is the eye, and it goes through that. Therefore, your eye is good. The whole body's full of light. If the eye is bad, the whole body's full of darkness. If therefore that light is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And here's the repeating verse. No one can serve two masters for they will either hate one and love the other or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And then he goes into some other things here. Verse, I'm just going to kind of grab some things out of this. Verse 25, he says, I say to you, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat and drink. Don't worry about your body. Is life not more than food and clothing and body? Is it not more than that? And then he talks about the birds and he says, see the birds, they don't reap nor sow in the barns, but your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than the birds? Which you, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a stature? What is your worry going to do? It's not going to do anything. And he said, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field that grow uh, neither toil nor spin. And yet you're, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God clothes the grass of the fields, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, uh, he which is, uh, uh, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Verse 31 says, therefore do not worry. Verse 32 says, your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But then verse 33 makes a key statement. Seek first. There's that first word again. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added. He said, so don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will have its own problems. You take care of today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Adam Clark said this. No man can serve two masters. The master of our heart may be fitly termed the love that reigns inside of our heart we serve that only which we love supremely a man cannot be perfect in difference between betwixt two objects which are incompatible he's inclined to despise and hate whatever he does not love supremely 
Our blessed Lord shows here the utter impossibility of loving the world and loving God at the same time. You cannot do it. He who gives his heart to the world robs God of it and is in a sna- and snatching in the shadow of earthly goods loses substantial and eternal blessings. How dangerous is it to set our heart upon riches seeing it is so easy to make them our God. Now, Let me leave you with two stories. I know I've been long here this morning, but I hope you're getting these principles. Let me leave you with two stories. I have a friend of mine. uh, was a very close friend of mine. And uh, he was married, had some children. And he was caught up in this this spirit of mammon. As a matter of fact, he he made a statement that he was going to continue to move uh, his family and move them around whatever location he needed to until he got to a certain dollar amount of a salary. He was seeking to get to the point at this time, this has been, this has been several years ago, but at this time he was, his goal was $100,000 a year. If I can just get to $100,000 a year, then I'm, I'm going to be where I need to be. And so whatever I got to do, wherever I got to go, whatever I got to move to get there, that's where I'm going. That is following after a spirit of mammon, not after God. Okay? Remember, those two spirits are contrasting each other. If I get this amount of money, then everything's going to be okay. I'll have exactly what I need. Then I can coast back. Everything's going to be okay. That man today has finally reached that goal. As far as I know, he's probably gotten beyond that goal. But he doesn't live for God. His marriage is gone. He has no marriage. He's divorced. And, and all of his children have no clue what it means to live for God. They have been taught that success comes in the form of dollars. How sad that for the generations to follow, it's not about following after God. It's following after mammon. Because mammon is a spirit. And so with all of that, did you finally hit the significance that mammon promised you? Because remember, mammon makes promises that it cannot keep. So you might be significant in dollar amount, but when it comes to the wholeness of your home and your family and your children, you're very lacking. Last one, stand with me. Some of you may have heard this. I know maybe young people have heard this before. I went to to school, high school with a young man. I don't want to say any names or anything, but I went to high school with a young man. And uh, <clears throat> when it came to these other promises of mammon, uh, you know, happiness and uh, uh, significance, stability, uh, everybody knowing who you are, you've got all the money you need, you can have anything you want. Uh, he, he, he was the kind of guy that, I mean, he wore the, the name brand of everything. There was nothing that was not name brand. He wore the name brand of everything. Uh, he was popular, had the nicest car of any of us that were driving. You know, he didn't have what I had. He wasn't privileged to have a 72 Le Mans sports coupe. That's what I had. Yeah, I was privileged. I paid $300 for that car and made payments on it. And it was yellow. But I put me an audio Vox pair of speakers in the back window. And that raised the value. Those speakers were worth more than the car was. That car was so cool. When I would put the gas pedal down to make that thing go as fast as it would go, it'd shut the air off, the radio off. Everything else was shut off. Give all the power to the motor. He wasn't privileged like I was. But let me tell you about him. This guy who was popular, everybody knew him. He, he was one of those guys. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about a high school that just our senior class was as big as all of the Cab County High School. Everybody knew him. He was popular, and one day we come in to school, and over the loudspeaker in the classrooms, they said, we want to take a moment of silence and reflect on this young man who the day before left school and went home, got into the safe where a lot of those possessions are, and pulled out a gun and put it to his head and killed himself. Significance. Security, popularity, money, 
all the things that mammon promise that mammon can never deliver on. So if there's any point that I could get across to you today, I hope, I hope you've heard my heart in this. I hope you understand I'm trying to help you. That the first thing I got to do is decide who I'm going to serve. I'm either going to serve God or I'm going to serve mammon. But I cannot serve both. So if money's what you're after, that spirit of mammon's on your money. I'm just telling you, it's going to be cursed. Because mammon will not give you what it promises. But God, on the other hand, can give you joy and peace and comfort. And he can do it with a whole lot less money. Bow your heads with me. Lord, we love you today. God, I thank you, Lord, for your word, God, that you have presented to us. God, I know this probably not popular subject. and We're not running the aisles right now. But God, I pray, Lord, that anything that has been spoken here today, God, would reach down on the inside of us. God, I want heaven to be populated with the true riches of souls. And God, I want to do everything I can to plunder all of hell and pull every soul that we can from hell. But God, the only way that happens is when you speak to us. God, you speak to us, God, through our giving. God, you speak to us, God, through what you have blessed us with. And we bring back to you, God, and then you multiply it and you bless it. And it's used for your kingdom, God, that souls might be saved and reached. God, I pray, Lord, that you'll help each and every one of us here today. God, that we understand that the spirit of mammon is a spirit that is cursed. It's a spirit that puts itself in direct contrast to the spirit of God. And I can only follow after one master. I can only serve one master. And God, I've got to make a choice. God, I've got to make a choice. Now that it's been presented to me today, I've got to make a choice. I'm either going to serve God or I'm going to serve mammon, but I cannot serve both. God, I pray, Lord, that you will bless us today. God, I pray, Lord, that you will touch us today. God, I pray a hedge over every home represented here today. God, every family that's represented here today. God, I pray, Lord, that your blessing, God, would be upon them when the understanding comes. God, I know your word to be true. And God, I know that you will do exactly what you said you will do. God, I pray, Lord, that you will give us the boldness and the strength, God, the confidence to trust you and to test you. God, when you test us, God, that we test you in return and see that you bless us. God, I ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Give you all of the glory and all of the honor. And everyone said in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God bless you. I love you. 5.30 prayer tonight, 6 o'clock service. Let's come expecting the Lord to touch us. In Jesus' name. If you're part of Connection Ministries, oh, the new discipleship series starts over.